good evening sir good evening all uh, welcome to post graduation entrance test exrx india's online coaching and uh, today we are having the first session and i would like to take this opportunity to welcome dr b arun i am pt phd physiotherapist grade 2 government district headquarters hospital uh, e road and uh, he also he worked as a professor and also worked as a principal also earlier so his teaching will be uh, helpful for all the students present today here in the zoom and uh, we are live on youtube so those who missed the today's session they can watch it in youtube and i request uh, the participants to be uh, more interactive and make useful of this session now i welcome our resource person dr arun please sir thank you yes sir please sir you can start the session sir so we start yeah yes sir okay so good evening everyone um, in this juncture i would like to thank all the xrx team for making uh, for making me to do a presentation here uh, it was a privilege for me to for me to conduct this session so initially when dr chandramohan has called me i was really surprised and excited to be a part of the team so shall we go into the session sir sir i would request you to do a little bit louder sir okay so okay okay uh, so this session is like uh, i preparing a questions of around 10 questions and uh, the students uh, who are participants can can answer either in the chat box or or you can tell the access we have a, I, i just design this question as a as a as a scenario and i'm going to ask you uh, what is the appropriate answer for the questions so shall we go sir the first question yes sir okay are we are waiting for anyone no sir no sir slowly one by one they will be joining okay yes sir so first of all i would like to thank the xrx team and dr chandramohan for giving me the opportunity so students can we go into the first question okay so it was the, all the questions were bigger uh, kindly uh, read slowly i will also read through it uh, please understand the question very well then we will go for the answers right uh, a 45 year old diabetic woman comes to the opd with a complaint of shoulder pain for the past 6 months her complaints was unable to wear her blouse or shirt she was unable to do abduction and external rotation on palpation she has a pain on the anterior shoulder she has a radiating on the arm over the biceps region she is a non diabetic and she is on 5 years of diabetic and was on medications she works as a computer assistant who sits in front of the computer for 6 hours in a day her radiological investigation shows minor degenerative changes in the c4 c5 c6 c7 blood investigations are within the normal limits arm drop sign is negative speed test is negative md can test is negative right so what is the diagnosis of this condition is it a cervical spondylosis brachial neuralgia or adhesive capsulitis so i will just go to the previous slide so that everyone can read one more time Akshita says C. Yeah, adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis. Yeah. So how it is adhesive capsulitis? Right, very much. So most of us uh, got the point. Uh, we'll see how it is adhesive capsulitis. So uh, it is not cervical spondylosis. Although the patient having a minor uh, radiological changes like degenerative changes in the C4, C5, C6, C7. Uh, it is not a cervical spondy like this or spondylosis. Uh, we are able to say that uh, it is an adhesive capsulitis because the first point what you are supposed to note is a patient with a diabetic woman or a diabetic person complains of five months of duration. Mostly they have a shoulder stiffness. Right, ninety percentage of the patient with the uh, diabetic uh, has 
shoulder complaints. So that's the first thing you are supposed to know. The second thing, what we are supposed to notice, he was unable to wear the gloves because he was unable to do abduction and external rotation, right? So the first movement gets affected in the adhesive capsulitis is external rotation. When you are not able to do external rotation, your abduction will get restricted. So once you are do the external rotation only, your abduction was able to do. So the first movement gets affected is the external rotation. So that should be noted in the adhesive capsulitis. Sometimes, right, like rarely the patient with adhesive capsulitis has pain radiating to the biceps region. Sometimes it may also radiate to the trapezius region. Adhesive capsulitis may have a radiation symptom. So if the patient with adhesive uh, the radiating symptom doesn't mean that it is no problem. Very rarely the adhesive capsulitis might have a radiation of the symptom. And the other things what we have noted is Palpation on the anterior shoulder causes pain, right? So there's a capsule tightness on the anterior side. So when you palpate on the anterior side, the patient will have severe pain. That is one of the important points we are supposed to know. Others, I, I just put this bad illustration on just to confuse it. And uh, how it related to the uh, person sitting in the computer. When the person sits in the computer for more than few hours, they, they knowingly, unknowingly goes for the slouch portion. When the, when the shoulder goes for the kyphosis, there is a lot of restriction in the shoulder that may also enhance the tightness in the shoulder. So as I put, the arm drop sign is negative, right? So there is no, uh, no involvement of rotator cuff rupture. In rotator cuff rupture, the patient have a positive arm drop sign, right? And the speed test is negative. Speed test is for to, to identify the biceptor tendinitis. So it is also negative. Empty can test is negative to identify or, or a confirmatory test for the supraspinal test tendinitis. So all these are negative. So uh, and we are we are able to conclude it as adhesive capsulitis, right? Is that clear, students? Shall we go for the next? Most of them, I think everyone has uh, told the correct answers. Yes. Sir. Anybody wants to uh, discuss this question further? Any doubts? Please raise uh, your hand. Yes, yes, please. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Good I'm Supraja. Yes, good evening. Uh, sir, um, according to some recent journals, they're saying all these tests, the uh, MT can test uh, yes. and uh, drop arm sign, all that, they're not, they say it's not very reliable. So how how reliable is it to, to you know, confirm a diagnosis based on that? Uh, all these special tests are very important because 90% of the special tests are available only. We, we have a reliability test and we have to that all the special tests are yeah. Yeah, more or less reliable. We will go with the history as well as the special test. We are not able to confirm only to the special test, whereas we are able to go with, along with the history of the individuals. Okay, sir. Thank you. As, as, as a, as a, as a musculoskeletal physiologist, we are supposed to understand the special test and has to do the special test so that it's a confirmatory test for the diagnosis which can be related with our clinical science and symptoms as like as your x-ray or ct scan report says please correlate with your clinical symptoms we are supposed to correlate with our clinical symptoms okay sir thank you sir thank you that was a good question shall we go to the second question yes uh, somebody is requesting you to talk a little bit louder okay 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 so we'll move into the second question. Question number two. A 60 year old woman uh, visits our outpatient department with the pain in the right side of the knee for past two years. Her chief complaints are unable to squat and not able to bend her knees. She's hypertensive for the past 10 years and on irregular medications. She's not taking proper medications. On observation, there is no deformity in the knee or the ankle. Tight hamstring muscles noted with 1990 at Radiology shows osteophyte formation in the knee and narrowing of the joint space is noted. Valgus test is positive, Metmore's test is negative, and Lachman's is negative. Right? So it's a 60 year old woman with a right knee pain and she was unable to squat and this is hypertensive woman. Tightness of the hamstring muscles, radiology shows osteophyte formation, joint space narrowing. 
valve stress is possible with no assistance. This is the MCL medial collateral ligament injury or osteoarthritis of the knee, patellofemoral pain syndrome or ACL rupture. How it is loading? Although it is a straightforward question. So, how we will confirm it as osteoarthritis of knee joint? The first thing what we are supposed to note down here is the patient having pain in the knee joint, right? The first thing is there. The second thing is the age factor. So, patient with the 60 years of age might have a degenerating changes in the knee joint. The first and the chief, uh, first and foremost complaints given by the patient is unable to squat. So the patient was not able to do a squatting movement. It's the first thing uh, you are supposed to know. And the second thing, usually the patient have a deformity. Uh, the, what deformity we obviously do? It is a yellow valve and deformity. Okay? So still the patient doesn't have a deformity, doesn't mean that it is not a degenerative changes. Most of the patients with the osteoarthritis of the knee joint have a tight hamstring muscles. So, which can be elicited by the special test like 1990 test. We will make the patient in a supine line, hip is flexed to 90 degrees, and then we will ask the patient to extend the knee to 90 degrees. When the, when the patient was not able to do the test, it shows there is a tightness of the hamstring muscles. And along with our clinical diagnosis, we are able to go for the radiological findings like osteophyte changes, uh, degenerative changes, uh, uh, degenerative arthritis has uh, osteophyte changes, uh, like uh, there will be uh, uh, changes occurs in the articular cartilages, so it is well noted in the x rays, as well as narrowing of the joint space because of uh, weight bearing, the joint space was narrowed. And the, to confuse everyone, I just put McMoonis is negative and Lachman is negative. Valgus test is positive. Sometimes osteoarthritis of the knee joint may do a valgus test. And if the valgus test is positive, it indicates that there's a medial uh, degenerative changes. Not only in the collateral ligament test, it is uh, it, valgus and valgus tests are positive. Sometimes in the degenerative changes also, val valgus and valgus tests are positive. So it is not a patellofemoral pain syndrome because the patient doesn't have any other features like uh, uh, immediate pain or stiffness uh, like that. It was not noted here. So it is not a patellofemoral pain syndrome. And patellofemoral pain syndrome mostly comes in the young individuals, not in the elders. And ACL rupture is not ACL rupture because ACL injury, uh, their Lachman test mostly will be positive. And the patient is also 60 years elder, so elderly patient doesn't have or a very less chance of getting a ligamentous injuries. So it is a straightforward, clear question. It says that it's an osteoarthritis of the knee joint. But recently, uh, many orthopedicians have told that the osteoarthritis of the knee joint is uh, is not described. It is also described as a degenerative joint disorder. Because they found that there is no inflammation occurs in the knee joint, so it is not the arthritis, it is rather than a joint de degeneration. So some of the, the new recent orthopedic textbook has put uh, the OME as a DJD, degenerative joint disorders. Any, any doubts in this? The participants or aspirants, if you have any doubts, you can raise your hand. I'll directly we'll talk to our resource person. We'll go into the third question. Yes, sir. We can move on to the next question. Right. So most of the questions what I discussed, uh, what I'm displaying here are very easy and we are able to answer very good. Uh, I don't find the questions are very tough. Uh, here is the third question. The 36-year-old IT professional complains of aching discomfort, easily fatigability of the muscles in the forearm. She complains of pain, weakness, and uh, complaints of pain and weakness exacerbated by activities which require repetitive pronations. Patient complains of inability to tight the fist, so she was not able to tight the fist. Nocturnal pain is present. On examinations, phalanx tests and tunnel tests are negative. Pain is exacerbated by repetitive elbow flexion and symptoms arise in the forearm as well as in the hand. There was a sensory disturbance also noted in the medial three and a half fingers and along on the forearm. 
So the patient is IT professional, 36 year old person, discomfort in the muscles of forearm. Pain was uh, increased when doing activities, especially in the repetitive elbow flexion. And she has symptoms in the medial three and a half fingers. So is it the carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, pronate arterial syndrome, or thoracic outlet syndrome? What is that? Right, so things what we are supposed to note down here is the patient having a complaints in the uh, forearm muscles and she has a complaint especially on the repetitive pronunciation and this was not able to make a tight fist. Nocturnal pain is present. Usually nocturnal pain is present only on the nerve injuries. Any nerve pathology you have nocturnal pain. And the patient have negative phalanx tests and tunnel tests. So negative phalanx tests and tunnel tests means the patient, uh, the patient have a, when you ask the patient to do a phalanx test, a reverse phalanx test or a tunnel test. So when the patient says it is positive, so on the patient asks the patient for uh, 30 seconds and the patient says there's a numbness in the fingers, it indicates it is a carpal tunnel syndrome where there's a compression of the median nerve. So this is not a median nerve compression. So we rule out the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Whereas pronator TV syndrome is a compression of the uh, radial nerve in the pronator muscles. So radial nerve compression is resembles as a tennis elbow. So all these radial, radial nerve features are there, but this patient, what I have discussed here, is the patient having a is a, is a patient having a, a sensory disturbance in the medial three and a half fingers. So medial three and a half fingers was supplied by the ulnar nerve. So either this patient having a cubital tunnel syndrome or a thoracic outlet syndrome, right? So how we will differentiate it is a cubital tunnel or a thoracic outlet syndrome? So usually thoracic outlet syndrome uh, has a pain in the uh, shoulder as well as in the forearms, right? So it's a low compression of the lower trunk of brachial plexus results in the thoracic outlet syndrome. And when you do lose this, we are able to identify it as a thoracic outlet syndrome. But here the patient has a pain in the uh, forearm muscles and weakness and repetitive flexion extension causes pain. So when you do repetitive flexion extension, there is a excessive movements in the elbow and the, the, the nerve, ulnar nerve, which passes superficially over here, will get impinged. So this is a cubital tunnel syndrome. The patient will get uh, impingement in the ulnar nerve and the cells producing pain. So it is a uh, it is a it is a cubital tunnel syndrome, right? Front okay. yeah. syndrome is a medial nerve compression, this is a uh, medial nerve symptoms. Plus here the medial three and a half fingers was involved and sensory disturbances, it is ulnar nerve distribution, so it is a Cubital tunnel syndrome. Like any any discussions in this? Some of the students have put to know it is a, a pronate arterial syndrome or a carpal tunnel syndrome. Since it is a repetitive pronation causes pain, you might all think that it's a pronate arterial syndrome, but still it is not a pronate arterial syndrome. Any of them? Any doubts, dear participants? As friends want to talk with the resource person? So little no, tricky sir. questions, little little tricky questions. So right, uh, so most, most of them are uh, able to identify answers. So we we'll move on to question number four. Uh, this is also a straightforward easy question. Nineteen-year-old basketball player complains of pain in the left knee for the past six days. She plays basketball for the past ten years and plays three hours per day. Right, so for nine years she started doing basketball and she's playing at least three hours per day. Her shoe was one year old. Right. She was having a history, no history of fall. So there is no history of fall. She complains pain around the knee, mortal swelling was noted and limited range of motion. On palpation, there was a grade two tenderness on listed below the petala. Right? So there was a tenderness present below the petala. Clot test and petala grind test were negative. There was no uh, features of clot test and petala test and Lachman test is negative. McMorris test is also negative. So what may be the diagnosis? Is it a contraumulation of petala, pre-petala bursitis, pre-sansinous bursitis, or ACE? So 
He's a 19 year old basketball player who always jumps. There is a mark swelling in the knee and uh, his limited range of motion. He has great return as a visitor. Like it's a pre petla bursitis. How we confirm it is a pre petla bursitis? The first thing we are supposed to note down is the uh, tenderness below the petala. And uh, what's the other name for pre petla bursitis? Anyone can. Anyone message me what is the other name for pre petal bursitis? Pre petal bursitis. The first name of the So it is also called as housemates. Usually, housemates speak. Uh, a patient have uh, usually occurs in the, in the players, especially in the basketball, volleyball players. They, they just jump, uh, which causes uh, inflammation of the bursa. Here, from the history, we are able to identify there was a pain around the knee joint, swelling was noted, and limited range of motions. Uh, it is not a contramalacia petala since the patient doesn't have a positive petala grind test as well as clark test. Both are the confirmatory tests for the. Uh, Contramalacia petala are also called as petalofemoral pain syndrome. As well as in the Contramalacia petala or the petalofemoral pain syndrome, you feel tenderness over the petala than uh, below the petala. It's inferior part of the petala. When you feel tenderness, then it will indicate there is some bursitis, inflammation of the bursa. Uh, other than that, there is no problem in the in the ligament injuries because Lachman test is negative. It's a confirmatory test for ACL. McMurray's test is negative, it's a confirmatory test for meniscal, so all these are negative. Uh, we can rule out all these things. And when you go and look into that, we, we have only two options for the pain. One is a contramalacia petula or the pre petula bursitis, pre petula bursitis. So pre petula bursitis is the right answer because uh, she has a limited range of motion, marked swelling, and grade two tenderness. And moreover, when, when you wear a poor shoes or ill-fitting shoes, which also will, will precipitate or, or increase uh, the, the chance of getting the pre petal bursitis. So usually the players will get pre petal bursitis. So the appropriate answer is the pre petal bursitis for this question. It's also not a best answer in bursitis. So, Shall we move on to the next? Sir? Shall we move on to the next question? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, can you say argument? about yeah. Pesanserinus bursitis, sir? Pesanserinus bursitis is the inflammation of the bursa by the hamstring tendons. Mostly patient complaints of the pain in the lower lateral border of the knee and the anterior border. So, the bursa which lies up between the hamstring tendons. So, this inflammation occurs in the hamstring tendons because of the repetitive flexion extension. So this condition patient has a pain in the anterior border, so it is not a best answer in this process. So we'll move on to the next yes, question. Yes, sir, for next question. Thank you for asking that. Right, question number five, a female farmer complains of pain in the left wrist. Okay, this is also some tricky question. You are supposed to find out the difference between the first answer and second answer. Uh, she had a say, she's a disorder. Complaints of pain uh, in the wrist travels up to the forearm on the radial side. So there is some radiating pain she also feels. Two days back, she had a seizure attack after her form and fall on the left side. On palpation, tenderness was present over the anatomical stuff box. Examination revealed a snapping sensation when moving the left thumb. Uh, and front questions, a front questions just, uh, is positive, x-ray shows no abnormal. So the 34-year-old farmer. Complaints of pain in the left wrist. She has a seizure disorder. She had a fall and she complains of pain in the wrist and travels up to the forearm and the radial side. And the palpation tenderness over the anatomical stuff box. So, what is the diagnosis? Is it a scaphoid fracture or a Guyon's canal syndrome or a recurrence disease or handlebar cancer?
Yeah, answering C, sir. Thank you, Ryan. Answering C, sir. Thank you, sir. So, straight for the question. But why not it is a scaphoid fracture? How we rule out the scaphoid fracture? Since this, when you palpate the scaphoid bone on the under first of box, patient complains of pain. That's one of the diagnostic, a clinical diagnostic test to rule out the scaphoid, um, scaphoid fractures. So, but uh, still the patient has a complaint on the under first of box. But X ray shows there is no abnormality, so we can rule out. The only thing what we are going to say it is a recurrent disease is frontal stenosis. So when you, when you make a fist and ask the patient to move on the ulnar side, the patient has a pain in the in the in the in the radial side of the radial side. That indicates there is a uh, recurrent disease. There is a degenerative changes in the in the tendons. Uh, Apart from that, I just put a seizure disorder to confuse the people. Uh, the seizure disorder doesn't have any relation with the recurrence, right? Uh, the other other is Guyan's canal syndrome. What is Guyan's canal syndrome? Is uh, is it is it is uh, 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 ulna uh, nerve injury where the ulna nerve gets trapped on the uh, hook of the hammer. So the patient will have a tenderness or, 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 or variation over the ulna nerve region. Same as handlebar palsy, those who are long, long cyclists will, will keep the wrist in the flexion portion, passes compression of the ulnar nerve, results in the ulnar nerve palsy. Right? So it is not the ulnar nerve palsy because patient doesn't have a features of medial thrill of finger weakness or any, 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 anything in the hypotenar muscles, where, where the patient has only pain on the medial side of the wrist. So the, the, the confusion between it is a scaphoid bone, bone injury or a decumbent disease. And since the X ray says there is no, no problem, and we'll go for the decorum uh, species. So we'll go into this next question. Yeah. So a yeah, 44 year old male taxi driver complains of pain in the lower back region. Uh, physician referred to physiotherapist advises IFT and IPT. Many physicians does that. They, if the patient has a low back pain, they just uh, write to us as a put traction and, uh, and have the IPT. That's that is the only thing they know, right? Most of the physicians. And history says that he'll drive for nine hours. He didn't carry heavy weights or, or uh, balance wasn't carrying uh, recently. He didn't do anything. Pain aggravates while climbing stairs, driving for long hours, and pain increases uh, on abduction and internal rotation. On observation, there is no abnormalities in the spine. So when you, when you see the spine, there is no abnormal no deviation. Palpation, when you palpate the spine, you are able to palpate on the L5 as well. Weaken. There is a mild, uh, painful uh, thing is there. Radiating pain on the posterior, they occasionally, uh, radiological says there is a degeneration in the L3, L4, L5. SLR and slump tests are negative. Faber's test is possible, right? So it's a 44-year-old man, complains of low back pain. He's a driver, so he always drives nine hours. And the, the pain was increased in driving for three hours as well as climbing stairs. Pain was noted in adduction and interpretation. What is the diagnosis? Is it an intervertebral disc prolapse? Sacroiliac joint dysfunction? Pyriformis syndrome? Or lumbar spondylosis, it's intervertebral disc collapse, acrylic joint dysfunction, pyriform syndrome, or lumbar spondylosis. So it's easy, it is very easy, but not a same joint dysfunction, it is a pyriform syndrome. So, why you are getting confused with the same joint dysfunction is as he told, Faber's test is positive, right? So Faber's test, what is Faber's test? Faber's test is flexion, abduction, external rotation of the hip joint. Pain in the hip indicates hip pathology. Pain in the SA joint indicates SA joint pathology. Though the Faber's test is positive, he doesn't have a SA joint involvement. So only based on the Faber's test, we are not able to say it is a SA joint pathology. But still, SA joint was also involved since this condition is a pyriformis syndrome. Because pyriformis muscle pass through the SA joint, so when you palpate it, you are you are you have a pain in the uh, L5 S1. Uh, every every person getting older, you will have a little bit change in the lumbar spine. And the main point, what they are going to note is the mid buttock region. So pain in the greater sciatic notch, or when you when you palpate your uh, patient and the patient has pain over there, that indicates it is a pyriformis syndrome. 
Apart from that, the pyriformis syndrome is also confirmed as an increased pain noted in adduction and internal rotation. And the patient has difficulty in climbing stairs, right? So these things will help you to confirm it is a pyriformis syndrome. And it is not a SA joint. One more thing, I will say there is a no fall or no carrier heavy weights recently. So no carrier heavy weights or no fall indicates the patient doesn't have an intervertebral disc prolapse or patient doesn't have a SA joint symptoms. So it is not lumbar spondylosis. Since although the X-ray shows degeneration, it doesn't indicate it is a lumbar spondylosis. Right? So sometimes, uh, mostly when you get older, when you, when you take X-ray after 40 years, 50 years, 90% of the individual has shown there's a degeneration in this spine. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that the spine degeneration is there. So it is a, a spondylotic changes. Right? So the correct answer, appropriate answer is the pyriformis symptom. Is it okay for you? Any discussions over here? Sir, yes, sir. One question from YouTube, sir. Yes, sir. I think fourth question, I think. Why not Condra Malaysia of Patella? I think fourth or fifth. Yes, sir. Fourth question. Condra Malaysia of Patella is ah, not yes. there because the special test, Clark test, and the Patella grade test were negative. That's what I told you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, Kumar Monal, you got the answer. We can move on to the next question, sir. So we move on to the question number seven. So this is also a very, very easy question. We are able to identify very quickly. 18-year-old college students complains of pain in the shoulder. His, his history says that uh, he attempted to lift heavy objects in the college and from that he, he has a pain in the shoulder, worsen while overhead activities. So when he does any overhead activity, it gets worsened. He's a volleyball player and plays for his college. He has a thyroid problem in the early life. On examination, no abnormalities of shoulder, full range of motion in the shoulder, pain over the anterior shoulder while palpation. Speed test is positive, knee test or Hopkins test are negative. Right? So he's a 18 year old college student and a basketball player, a volleyball player, and he does sudden lifting of heavy object causes shoulder pain. And the pain was increased on the overhead activities, and there was no abnormality, full range of motion, pain in the anterior shoulder. The speed test was positive, other test was negative. The options are bicep structure, rotator cuff injury, supraspinatus symptomatic syndrome, bicep tendinitis. tendinitis. Bicep structure, rotator cuff injury, supraspinatus symptomatic syndrome, and bicep tendinitis. One is saying A bicep structure, another one is saying E is answer. Bicep structure is a good guess, but still uh, there was full range of motion of the shoulder. You cannot say it is a bicep structure. And one of the one of the positive features of bicep structure is when you ask the patient to bend uh, the shoulder, you are able to uh, bend, bend the elbow, you are able to get a poison, right? So when you ask the patient to flex the elbow, the bicep structure, the, the, the Popeye sign will be found out. So when you see the Popeye sign, it, you can say that it's a bicep structure. But a speed test is positive only in patients with the bicep tendinitis. So it is not rotator cuff injury since I, I put a nail test is negative, half inch test is negative. So there is no rotator cuff injuries. And uh, the patient have lifted the heavy weight and overhead activity is problem. So overhead activity always causes biceps or rotator cuff. Since we say that uh, knee tests and heart rings are negative, so we can rule out rotator cuff, whereas we will stick back to the biceps. So the only condition here which was noted is the bicep tendinitis. Supraspinatus and rotator cuff is ruled out because we don't have the knee test or heart rings tendinitis. Both are negative. And there is no bicep structure because I said uh, the patient will have a poison. So we will find place with the Biceptal tendinitis. Although it is a little confusing, but uh, based on the speed test, we are able to say that it is a biceptal tendinitis. Based on the features, what I have done. Right? Is it clear? It's not SA, supraspinatus impingement syndrome or the rotator cuff injury because all the special tests are negative. And the patient have full range of motion. Bicep structure patient doesn't have a full range of motion. 
and pain on the anterior shoulder, right? So it's also not the only type of maybe supraspinatus we can consider, but still the more the tests are negative, uh, so we, we can uh, exclude supraspinatus. The only condition here which is possible is the bicep tendonitis. Right, so we move on to the next question, question number eight. Uh, this is also a very, very easy question. A 21 year old college student complains of back pain when he attempted to lift a body 800, which is proper injury to a disc car, right? So, this was actually happened to one of my students. Uh, the car was parked in front of this car. So, he tries to lift the car up and he starts moving. He thinks that he was able to lift it up and move, but uh, he ends up with a pain in the back. So, he has a radiating pain. Uh, till the posterior cuff, sometimes till the cuff, he feels aggravation of pain during coughing and sneezing. His pain aggravates while driving for the car more than one hour. Examination of this muscles, examination spasm over the paraspinal muscles and feel tenderness of the L5S1. ROM is restricted in both flexion extension. There's no, no abnormalities in the bone, slump test, etc. So, very, very easy condition, right? Everyone can say it's IVD. It's not tidy from the sense he, he has lifted, he tries to lift. There's no lumbar spondosis. We can rule out lumbar spondosis since it is a younger group. So there is no lumbar spondosis. There is no SA joint dysfunction also. So there is no involvement of SA joint. It's a side forward question. You are able to answer because it's a 21 year old boy. So he might, he might not have a lumbar spondosis that is very, very rare. So there is no degeneration. He has a history of sudden lifting. Heavy lifting always causes risk to push out and causes disc collapse. And the radiating symptoms also says he has a disc collapse. One important thing everyone should note as a, as a DPT graduate, we are supposed to know coughing, sneezing. If the patient says pain, it indicates disc collapse. When the patient tries to cough, tries to sneeze, or when he do a valsalva maneuver, and the patient says there's an increase in pain, something coughing also increases pain. When the patient says all these uh, which aggravates the pain, then you are supposed to think about, right, it is not a, uh, it is not a muscle problem, it is a nerve problem. So from that also we are able to identify. Most of the, most of the diagnosis we are able to make uh, through the proper history collected from the patient. And other features which helps, it is a back pain because the patient has a spasm, paraspinal muscle spasm, tenderness over there. And the uh, slump test SLR or positive, which shows it is a anterior vertebral disturbance. Someone is asking what? Which question? Okay, once I finish the question, I'll come back and answer it. Right? Yes, sir, that will be the best. So it is a pile, it is a anterior disturbance, very, very straightforward. Uh, one more thing I just want to ask you. Which side the prolapse occurs? Is it anterior, posterior, posterior? Can anyone can type the answer? Anterior, posterior, posterior lateral. Which side commonly this prolapse occurs? Posterior lateral. Very good, very good, very good. Why? Is there any reason behind it? Uh, posterior lateral. Very, very good. Yeah. Because the force in which it acts, it usually acts on superior uh, It acts, uh, the vertebra is positioned in such a way that it compresses the disc anteriorly. So the uh, protrusion will be posterior. And because of the ligaments present, it's mostly on the lateral aspect and not like directly pro posterior. Yeah, yeah, you're almost right. But uh, it's not ligament weakness. Uh, what are the contents of the disc? When you look at the disc, we have three components, right? One is the nucleus pulposus, nucleus pulposus and the fibrosis, fibrosis, and the vertebral end plates. Yes. Uh, so nowadays, vertebral end plate was uh, strongly attached with the vertebral body. We are not considering it as a part of the disc. Whereas we are considering only the annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus are the a part of the disc. When we look at the biomechanical component of the annulus fibrosis, annulus fibrosis are arranged in a circular manner, like cross, cross linked in circular manner. When you look at the picture of the annulus fibrosis, you are able to understand it very well. Uh, somehow it was designed that the posterior lateral part of the annulus fibrosis are a little weaker when compared to the posterior and the anterior. 
So that is one of the reason why the nucleus can escape from the center to the late outside is through the posterior lateral part of the disc. So that is one of the reason why the posterior lateral uh, disc collapse is uh, very common. Very good answers, everyone. Next, shall we go into the next question? Right, question number nine. Uh, this is also a very easy question. 35 year old female homemaker comes to our patient department with a pain in the heel. She has a pain in the early morning when she attempted to do first step and reduces after 15 20 minutes. She also complains pain in the heel after sitting few hours. So once she sits for a few hours and she is getting pain in the heel. Examination reveals that she has a flexible flat foot, has difficulty to flex the foot and bring the toes towards the shoe. Tightness of the calf muscle is also noted. She always wears high heels. Radiological features show is normal, but in this case, it's normal. So she's a homemaker, 35 years old lady, complains of pain in the heel, pain especially in the early morning. She has a flat foot, a flexible flat foot. She has a tight calf and wears high heels. So what may be the options? Retrocalcanal bursitis, tarsal tunnel syndrome, Plantar fasciitis or tendoarthritis. Okay, so next question. How you will consider how you will say it is a plantar fasciitis? So we are supposed to look at the features. Every patient with a plantar fasciitis complains of same complaints only. Usually the patient age is above 30 years and the first complaint what the patient says the, when, I, when, they, when, when I wake up in the morning I was not able to keep my foot in the ground that is very painful that's the first complaint every patient will see because during night our foot will go for the plantar flexion on all the muscles and the, the introsius and the, and the muscles will go for the relaxed portion when you stretch the muscles in the morning it starts aggravation of the center. That's the first thing every patient will see. You see, in uh, 100 patients of plantar fasciitis, 99 patients will say that that is the first symptom they will see. Early morning, I was not able to keep my foot in the ground. And apart from that, uh, the other the helpful diagnosis, he has a flexible flat foot. What is a flexible flat foot? Flat foot, uh, uh, your, your arches are present in the, in the person. Uh, when, when there was a non-weight wearing, that is when, when the person wears the weight, the arches will go flat and the work person is non-weight wearing, the arches is present. That is when you sit, make the patient to sit and observe it, the patient have arch. That is when you ask the patient to stand, the arch will disappear. That is called as flexible flat foot. And if you have rigid flat foot also, the arch is not present either in sitting or weight wearing or non-weight wearing. So if it is a flexible flat foot where the patient tries to Put the weight, and there was this overstretching of the plantar fascia, which aggravates the symptoms, and it is one of the common cause for the plantar fasciitis. Apart from that, the patient always wear the high heel, one of the uh, common features of the uh, aggravation of the plantar fascia involvement. And tight calf muscle. So, although you can say the tight calf muscle, it, it is it is not uh, it is a tendinitis, tendinitis, because we say. The so calf muscle is tight, so why not it is a tendinitis tendinitis? Calf muscle tightness are noted in 90% of the patient with the plantar fasciitis. When the calf muscle is tight, it causes alteration of the biomechanics of the calcaneus, which results in the tightness of the plantar fascia. So this also alters the plantar fascia and reproduces the pain. So calf muscle tightness is also one of the common features seen in the plantar fasciitis. So it is not retrocalcaneal bursitis since the patient doesn't have any uh, pain over the calcaneum or any pain over the posterior part of the calcaneum. So we can also uh, remove that it is not retrocalcaneal bursitis. There is no way this tarsal trans syndrome because there is no radiating pain, nothing here. So it is not a tarsal trans syndrome and, uh, and it is not a, a tendonitis tendency because the patient doesn't have any of the other features. The only possible or the best uh, answer for this question will be plantar fasciitis. Okay? So most of them have given the right answers. Uh, we move on to the next question. The last question. 
expect. So this is also a little tricky. So you have to think and answer. A 43 year old woman complains of pain in the low back. She had a road traffic accident two weeks back. She's a known diabetic. So she had a fall. So that we have to think about. She, she is known diabetic and complains of pain which radiates down to the posterior thigh. She has a pain radiates down to the posterior thigh. She has a pain while lying supine. So when she lies supine, she has a pain. Her pain reduced in sitting and forward bending. Tenderness in the lower back, spasm of the back, noted tight hamstrings and buttock muscles. She has a pain while walking an upright stance. While palpating, there's a step before the same in the posterior back. Anterior posterior view of the lumbar spine shows normal. So what is the diagnosis? Lumbar spondylosis, lumbar spondylolisthesis, lumbar disc collapse, lumbar vertebral fractures. Moving, sir, na. Unse ab general anatomy puchoge, unhe wo bhi nahi aayegi. Excellent, excellent. Everyone has told lumbar spondylolisthesis. How? Very simple lumbar spondylolisthesis. The patient had a fall, had a history of trauma. That is the one point you are supposed to know. And uh, as like. The other condition, lumbar spondylosis, the patient have a radiating pain in the posterior thigh. You can see in the spondylosis as well as spondylolisthesis. Uh, she has a pain reduction in sitting and forward bending. So, spondylolisthesis aggravates pain during extension, uh, flexion, right? especially in the forward bend. Uh, the pa pain uh, is more on walking upright and walking upstance as pain. And the main feature, what you are going to note down here is palpating a step like deformity. What is a spondylolisthesis? Spondylolisthesis is the anterior slippage of the vertebral body. So when you palpate the lumbar spine, you are able to palpate as a step like deformity, which is a confirmatory test for lumbar spondylolisthesis. Which vertebra commonly have lumbar spondylolisthesis? L5S1. L5S1 is a common area which you have lumbar spondylolisthesis. And uh, what X-ray we are supposed to take? I put as anterior posterior view of X-ray doesn't have a, uh, doesn't show any abnormality. Actually, when you have anterior posterior view doesn't have any abnormality in the lumbar spondylolisthesis because we are supposed to take an oblique view of X-ray. So oblique view X-ray shows there is a uh, spondyl, uh, spondylolisthesis. That is the anterior slippage of the So oblique view X-ray shows a dark terrier sign. Right? So when you take an X-ray, there is a a gap present on the pars interarticularis. So uh, the, the pars interarticularis looks like a dark, uh, dark collar in the dog. So if the, if the collar in the dog was break, it indicates there's an anterior slippage of the vertebra. So what is pars interarticularis? Yes, it is a part between the superior articulating facet and the inferior articulating facet. So that area is called a pars interarticularis. So the anterior body of the vertebra sits anteriorly, the posterior body stands before. So that causes lumbar spondylolisthesis. So you may, you may also think as a fracture, that's what anterior procedure doesn't have that no pain. So it is appropriate answer is the lumbar spondylolisthesis. Retrolisthesis is also one condition where the uh, lumbar vertebra or the vertebra moves backward is called as retrolisthesis. Okay, last question, we'll go on to the 11th one. So this is also a little tricky question. So 23 year old athlete comes to you with a complaint of pain in the thigh. Pain is worse in the downhill running, become worse when at the activity after pain phase start. He also complains pain radiates from the knee proximal or distally. On examination, pain local is on the lateral part of the knee. Tenderness over the lateral knee. Tender point at the lateral femoral condyle. Examination reveals of hip abduction and weakness of hip abductors. Specifically, gluteus medius got weakened. Overstress and no noble test were positive. Overstress and noble test were positive. So, is it a disc prolapse or neuralgia parasitica or IT band friction syndrome or hip snapping syndrome? Right, it is IT band friction syndrome. How it is IT band friction syndrome? Because the patient, uh, not only because of the positive test of overstress or noble test. Obestress is positive in IT band, uh, IT band tightness. You can see when you, when you do the obestress, it is clearly positive. Though it is a positive, the IT bands gets inserted on the lateral part of the knee joint. So there is a tenderness occurs in the knee joint. 
and there is a little for tumor content of tenderness. Along with that, sometimes the patient have a radiating features like the proximal or distilling in the in the knee joint because of IT band. So IT band tightness may also produce some radiating pain. It is not pure radiating as like as the uh, nerve involvement, but it is radiating. The pain is worse in downhill running and becomes worse after activity is a, is a common symptom of the IT band. Apart from that, there is a restricted adduction and weakness of hip abductor. That is, gluteus medius got weakened. So, when the gluteus medius got weakened, there was an increased activity of the other muscles to overtake it, which is one of the commonest diagnoses. We can make it as a IT band friction syndrome. It, it is not meralgia parasitic. There is more uh, nerve compression occurs in the lateral femoral cutis nerve of thigh. Whereas, this lateral femoral cutis nerve of thigh also has a uh, pain in the lateral part of the thigh, which resembles like IT band friction syndrome, but the patient will have a burning sensation in the thigh, and the patient have a history of wearing tight jeans or tight uh, tight uh, lower body uh, lower body vest, which causes uh, the neuralgia parasitic. It is not a hip snapping syndrome because when hip snapping syndrome is when the internal or external internal maybe there is a Leosoyas moves over the pelvis or external maybe the hip abductors, the gluteus moves or rubs over the femoral condens, which causes hip snapping. When you do abduction, the patient will have an audible click sound will be there. So here I didn't mention any audible click sound, so it is not a hip snapping syndrome. And it is not a malaria person, it is not a lumbar dyspola. Lumbar dyspola doesn't produce lateral side pain. Right? So the best possible diagnosis is the IT band friction syndrome. Like any any police? Sir, yes, sir, was somebody asked? Uh, yes, sir. In the chat box. Yes. Yeah, Do her mind, I think. Uh, yeah, that means he has asked me what, which is the how it is not essential on this one, sir. Right. Do her mind, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah, is this question you are asking a signal dysfunction or previous? Question? Yes, sir. This oh, one minute, sir. Not this one, sir. Not this one. Yeah. Is it this question? Taxi driver? Yes, sir. This ah, question, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's to confuse everyone. I just put Faber's test is positive. So you may confuse that it's a sacroiliac dysfunction, right? So Faber's test is positive in two conditions. One is the sacroiliac dysfunction. As well as hip pathology, like hip osteoarthritis, hip joint. When you do flexion, abduction, external rotation of the hip joint, pain in the hip produces hip pathology. Pain in the sacroiliac produces sacroiliac pathology. That is a common. Uh, but still, uh, um, there is no history of fall or no history of uh, heavy weight lifting or carrying heavy weight lift. That that may significantly motor that it is not a SA joint pathology. But uh, the pyriformis also runs over the SA joint, may cause the SA joint also will result in the pyriformis syndrome. Or pyriformis syndrome later on will cause the SA joint pathology also. The possible diagnosis for the, the best answer is the pyriformis syndrome, not the uh, SA joint pathology. Is, is it clear? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. The questions? Sir, uh, from Neha Sharma, sir, kindly show insight for PhD entrance. These type of questions comes. Uh, mostly, I, I think these types of questions were comes in the the CAD exams or when you go for the Canadian licenses or American licenses. All these types of questions will come. But mostly uh, uh, the entrance exam, uh, PhD entrance exams, mostly you get uh, questions on the statistics and bio uh, biostatistics and research methodology. Those who are interested, and, uh, they can also buy MCQ uh, physiotherapy. And, and I, I have given a, um, I think 30 questions or 20 questions, I'm not sure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir I, sir. I have given some questions to our Chandra uh, Mohan, and uh, he may supply it in the group. We can we can answer it and we can find out how you are, uh, you are able to answer that. Right? Yes, sir. I, the questions, I, I, questions are all based on the elect electrotherapy part. I have I have to only from the electrotherapy. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Sir, from uh, uh, YouTube, 
somebody has answered astrolysis why not they were asking 10th question i think yes sir that's that's not that step like deformity is very common in the spondylolysis not astrolysis thank you sir thank you so much and i thank all the participants also it was really interactive so without any disturbance you have answering and sending answers through chat sir very nice actually yes sir please sir yeah the, so next week i am going to take I, i'll just tell you everyone uh, please read to the special test next week we will have a special test uh, questions right so that we will yes. prepare well and come with answers don't expect me to give the lackman test or the common special test it will be uncommon special test only right so uh, we will i will try to make some photos and you will have to identify what is a special test we will we will have little more interactive right Yes. Next week, surely. Uh, so next week, next Wednesday, we will have a special test answer questions. So you all prepare for that questions, and we will have interactive sessions. Uh, Arun sir will be available every uh, Wednesday till uh, the entrance exam. Okay, as we get that. Bg and uh, on uh, every Friday, uh, Subhi will be taking classes for us. Not this Friday, from next Friday. and others also i will slowly uh, get their uh, uh, appointment and we can start one by one so tomorrow there will be no classes so the somebody has asked one question sir it is in the chat box can i read it sir so pain aggravation of long standing on foot of 30 years old what can be suspected where the pain aggravates who should tell where the pain aggravates is it in the foot back knee hip there the question was not clear right so pain aggravates on person will be here yes, sir we will last 30 years of age what can be question is from maybe where it was pain yoshita are you there where the pain is it in the foot or in the, the calf in the knee Because a small alteration in the foot may cause pain in the uh, small alteration in the foot may cause pain in the foot, pain in the knee, pain in the hip, till low back pain. The the the, the common cause may be a yes, small alteration. A small deformity in the foot may also cause low back pain. Pain in the calcaneum, right? So uh, Maybe a calcaneal spur. So you have to take the diagnosis, proper diagnosis to identify it. Calcaneal spur or plantar fasciitis may be the cause, and long-standing may cause aggravation of the symptoms. Sometimes when you palpate or the calcaneum and the patient feel pain, you can say it is a calcaneum, or the patient have a pain in the bursa, it is like right? retro calcaneal bursa, posterior part of the calcaneum in the palpate, and the patient have a pain or the inflammation or the swelling, you can say it is a retro calcaneal bursa. So first we have diagnosis. We have diagnosed. Uh, we have observed the patient, and then we are able to diagnose. As she said, so pain at calcaneum, sir. Yeah, uh, that's why pain in the calcaneum doesn't mean that uh, it's a calcaneal spur or plantar fasciitis. Maybe a calcaneal spur, maybe a plantar fasciitis, or maybe a retro calcaneal bursitis. So we are supposed to identify it through the observation, so as well as exam, clear examination of the patient. Yes, sir. And next week we'll next week we'll look into the special list. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes, thank you thank for our session, sir. Yes, sir. We'll, we'll meet you next week. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, good night all. Any comments, please leave here. Passes. Pardon. Any any comments, please send it to Dr. Chandra. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will do all questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank sir. you. Thank you. Bye, bye.